Hello and welcome to this, our fourth UN 2023 Water Conference talk show coming to you live from the SDG studio here at UN headquarters in New York. I'm Shakuntala Santhran, Shaks for short. And uh, this warning uh, that uh, the world will fail on climate and development if we fail on water, a dire warning from a newly released report, uh, turning the tide, a call to collective action. That's the inaugural report of the Global Commission on the Economics of Water. And uh, we're gonna be focusing on that report in this show and how we can turn the tide in the right direction. It's a, a collective call to action to different countries to manage the global water cycle for the global common good. The report minces no words. It says that a just and sustainable future of water is achievable, but we must act now and act together. Otherwise, no one, nowhere will be spared. You can find out uh, more about the report at this link, turningthetide.watercommission.org. It's there on the screen to help us understand the water crisis in its multiple dimensions. We have an exciting lineup of guests uh, here in the studio today, including uh, guests from the Global Commission. Here we have Johan Rockström, who is a co-chair of the Global Commission and a world leading climate scientist and water expert. He's the director of uh, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Potsdam, Germany. And uh, we're gonna check out this uh, clip, a presentation that you made uh, a short while ago. Mm. Dear colleague friends, we're taking colossal risks with the future of civilization on Earth. These are the 16 tipping elements, the large biophysical systems that we have scientific evidence that they regulates the state of the entire climate system on Earth. Nine of these 16 are showing signs of instability. Push them too far, and they will shift over from supporting humanity to starting to undermine humanity. Johan, that was really alarming. Can you help us understand the science? You used the term planetary crisis, not just climate crisis. And you also said later on in that same presentation, mass extinction. How worried, if it's not already obvious, should we all be? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, and great to be with you, Shakuntala. And, and well, to start with, um, science is, is, is unequivocal here. We have deep, deep reasons to be worried. Over the past 50 years, we have exponentially uh, increased our pressures on the planet. It's not only climate, it's also fresh water, biodiversity, all the loading of, of nitrogen and phosphorus that creates dead zones in our freshwater ecosystems, all the land system change that shifts the whole functioning of both biodiversity and freshwater. We have um, analytically mapped this through the so-called planetary boundaries. We've identified nine planetary boundaries that regulates the stability of the whole planet. They're there, quantified scientifically, to avoid crossing the tipping points that we saw in this little clip. And unfortunately, today we can conclude that six of those nine planetary boundaries are outside of their safe space. One of those nine is, one of those six is water. So we're, we're simply pushing the pressures on, on those systems that regulates the livability on Earth far outside the range that we scientifically know keeps the Earth system, the planet, not only in a state that supports us humans, but also in a state that keeps the whole planet stable. And, and what we also know today is that fresh water is behind all of these. You know, fresh water determines the amount of biomass, which in terms of the amount of carbon that is sequestered in nature. Fresh water is one of the greenhouse gases. Fresh water is behind all the food and all the health and all the species on Earth. So if you want to have, you know, a healthy planet, you need to have a healthy hydrological cycle. You talked about the hydrological cycle. We are changing that cycle with what we're doing here on planet Earth. So what does that mean for rainfall? Well, this is one of the, um, I would argue, personally, I find that to be one of the most challenging insights we have today, that for the first time in human history on Earth, we must recognize that we're changing the very source of fresh water. We're changing rainfall, changing precipitation. So we are pushing the whole water cycle out of balance. Why, are, what's, why is this happening? Well, to begin with, it's global warming. With more global warming, 
we load more energy in the whole planetary system. We actually cause more extreme events, more droughts, floods, heat waves that evaporates water. We're causing more droughts. But also, what happens is that when we have deforestation, we lose the green water flow. So we tend to, in water policy, focus only on the blue water, which is the liquid water in rivers, groundwater, lakes, what we use to store in dams. But the green water, which is two thirds of, the, of the, all the water, fresh water on planet Earth, is the water in the soil, is the water that is taken up by roots, sucked up in trees and plants, and that powers the whole photosynthesis and therefore actually powers all life on Earth. This green water is what generates in the order of 50% of next year's rainfall. So one half comes from the ocean, evaporating from the ocean, but a significant part, roughly half on average on Earth, comes from stable ecosystems. Now, we are changing this through deforestation, degradation of land, changing the composition of nature, and we're changing the climate. These two things together means that, for example, in the Amazon rainforest, that provides a significant portion of rainfall from Brazil down to Argentina, or from the Congo basin from Congo up to Nigeria. These interactions are now necessary for us to bring into the economics and the governance of water that we're so interdependent. We need to recognize that we need to collectively, as neighboring countries, take care of the water cycle collectively. Because this green water shows us we are all a lot more connected than we previously thought because the report is calling for a new science uh, of water and, and this is why. Yeah, much more. You know, if you look over the past 50 years, of course, there's been a lot of focus on transboundary river basins, of how to share water between upstream countries and downstream countries. Incredibly important, continues to be incredibly important. But now we must now add another river, namely the atmospheric rivers of water from upwind countries that provide rainfall to downwind countries. And this, this just shows that we are completely intertwined. I try to remind you know, my students and anyone who wants to listen that we're no longer this small world on a very big planet where there's this ample space of climate and ocean and biodiversity and water. We're today this big world on a very small planet and that we are filling up the entire space and consuming so large part of the biological cycle, of the biosphere, of the climate system. That's why we need collective action on water. I like how you phrased it in your video on the Global Commission's uh, website that neighboring countries have a diplomatic and also geopolitical reason to be good friends over shared water. Definitely, and, and we cannot afford conflicts over water. And there's a risk of conflicts over water, of course, with rising human pressures, with rising water scarcity. But now, you know, with, with all the evidence we have, we need to be very, very careful because, you know, up until recently, we just counted on, on water being stable every year. We, we so say we should be expecting roughly the same rainfall next year as the rainfall we've had on average over the past 10 or 20 years. That's no longer the case. Things are changing so fast. And that's why we need to have, we conclude, a new economics of water where we value water, both green and blue, for the management and the governance so that we can keep, keep the water at local, regional to global level intact. Johan, thank you so very much for explaining the science to us so very clearly. Now take a look at this. Strength lies in diversity. How can indigenous peoples and labor lead the charge towards a resilient water future? Right, now we'll look at uh, how to turn the tide on the water crisis through collective action from the perspective of labor and indigenous peoples. Uh, to help us out, we are joined by Maria Fernanda Espinosa, who is a commissioner of the Global Commission and former president of the UN General Assembly. And uh, Dr. Myrna Cunningham is an indigenous 
Misikitu leader from Nicaragua. She's chair of the guiding committee of the Pawanka Fund for Indigenous People and also vice president of the Fund for the Development of Indigenous Peoples of Latin America and the Caribbean. And Josh Newton is a, a, the founder of Josh's Water Jobs. You also do some independent consultancy right, in this sector. Thank you all so very much for your time. So clearly, Maria, if we could start with you, we're not on the right path. We can't keep going down the path we've been going. How can governance be changed to help tackle this water crisis? Well, I think that uh, we have heard uh, Johan uh, say that we need a multi-level governance arrangement. We, we need co-responsibility. We need to understand that we are water connected, that it's not about solving a problem at a, at a community level, but community level, national wise policy making, but we need urgently an international uh, architecture to address the challenge of governing water as a common good. Uh, it is not anymore about individual countries or transboundary waters. It's about the water cycle. It, it's about the precipitation dynamics. It's about too much water in some places, too little water in, in other places, and polluted water, which is affecting the health, well-being, and survival of people around the world. And it is a matter of equity and justice, because we cannot continue to live in a world where two billion people have no access to water and sanitation. And women spend 200 million hours per day just carrying water from one place to the other. That is not the world we need, we want, and deserve. So how do you get governments to change? Well, I think that uh, we have the science, we have the knowledge, we have the technologies. No? Uh, basically, what we need is political will, proper policies, listen not only to the Western science, but listen to the knowledge and the responses and solutions of water stewardship from indigenous peoples, from local communities, and scale up the responses from the very local to the city level, to the national, but to the international level. We need some prescription at the international level to address uh, the governance challenges of water as a common good because we are water interconnected. What happens in the Amazon affects the Horn of Africa. What happens in the Sahel affects Europe. We know, we have all the evidence now that shows that. So, and it's also on the side of the demand. You know, how much water we use. The more water we use, the less water we leave for the vulnerable and the poorest people of the world. And the other issue is investment. We need to triple, uh, to multiply by hundreds investment in water because it's good business. Maria mentioned indigenous peoples, Myrna. How do you think uh, indigenous peoples can help build a water resilient future? The first place, applying what we have applied for generations. If you look at communities, you look at areas like Cusco, or there's ancient architecture that has been developed to manage water systems, and they're still being used. If we look at communities, for example, communities in Ecuador, 20 years ago, they knew that deforestation was affecting their communities, and they began to plant in their watersheds. Now they have more watersheds and they have clean water. We can go to communities in like in Bolivia or Oaxaca and they combine their, their spiritual ceremonies to call on the spirits, but also to bring the communities together and define through their governance system how to manage their water system. And through that, they can ensure water for the next generations. So I would say the first thing is listen to the communities. Apply those ancestral practices. Make them part of policies, of program. Finance those type of practices. So you can upscale 
things that communities have been doing at the local level, at the national level, and of course at the international level. That's the way in which we believe we can contribute to a good governance system of water. And of course, this can only be done through a true dialogue, a dialogue that is based on respect of the human right to water for all. That was wonderful, uh, hearing about some of the uh, traditional practices that are, were, are eco-friendly and that we now need to look back towards because our modern ways uh, are not helping the planet. Uh, and Josh, uh, you uh, focus your work on the labor force as well. How can uh, the labor force, uh, uh, you know, play its role here um, in moving this in the right direction? Well, I'd say it's most first, it's a limiting factor because if we do all the things that Maria suggested, there isn't the workforce in place actually to carry all of that out. There's not enough talent, young professionals coming into the water and sanitation space to be actually, to actually carry out the initiatives that are, are planned. Um, and it's different in different parts of the world. In Global North, uh, the baby boomers are about to retire. And in the US, it's cited that uh, we'll need 1.4 million more people working in the water sector in the next decade because of the amount of people retiring, but without the backfill. In the Global South, just to achieve SDG 6, there's not the capacitated workforce available to actually implement those those uh, the goals um, so it's more now focusing on how do we attract talent how do we educate and train how do we ensure good jobs how do we retain a workforce and then mostly it's how do we diversify uh, the workforce how do we get more women involved in the workforce it's only 17 percent of the workforce is female worldwide it's a huge untapped source of talent um, and then indigenous uh, and in other parts of the world, just how do we get more people involved, young people passionate about the issue, involved in working towards these issues? And it is an all of society approach that we need to, to tackle this. And you need labor to be talking to um, education and the water profession and governments and private public sectors. It's all so linked and, and that's why I think the commission actually has a, can play a great role in that kind of dialogue that also you, Mirna, mentioned to move this uh, discussion forward. So how do you see uh, the commission helping facilitate this dialogue, uh, Maria? Well, we, we have produced and launched yesterday our first report, Turning, Turning the Tide. The next phase is about um, societal dialogues, is about listening. Mirna just said so clearly, you know, we need to be listened to. Uh, we need to learn to the good practices around the world. Uh, we need to understand better how we bring all sectors, a whole of society approach, a whole of government approach, because sometimes water is left to the water and sanitation area or to the environment area, a very little engagement from finance ministers. So we need really a, a holistic approach to water. Uh, so we will be organizing in the coming months a series of societal dialogues, both thematic and multi-sectoral, in different parts of the world, to listen uh, and, and, and to translate the dialogues into policy recommendations for our next report. But of course, we will have a voice as we prepare for the Sustainable Development Goals Summit in the coming September, but also for the summit of the future in 2024. So uh, we want to bring the conversation of water beyond the water and sanitation discussion. We heard very clearly that one of the most profound and, and worrisome crises is the green water crisis, the water that is contained or embedded in our ecosystems. Um, it's, it's, it's a determinant to have a water cycle rebalancing. And it's very much connected to the climate and the food crisis. If we do not solve the water crisis, which is solvable, we strongly believe that, we will not be able to solve the, the climate crisis, the food crisis, the health crisis. So um, the SDGs are an excellent tool, but they, they are siloed thematic, yeah. 
and we need to bring together a more interconnectedness uh, beyond the silo approach to understand the complexity of the world. One of the challenges of today's world is to deal with complexity and to respond with policies that reflect the complexity. And, 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 and again, the money is out there. Believe me, we see billions and trillions, and, but the money has to be channeled you know, to the water sector and to improve the quality of lives of people, of the vulnerable peoples. Uh, just Mirna would know that, but how many indigenous peoples have uh, access to clean water and to water and sanitation around the world? What do you need, Mirna, for you to work better. You're talking about uh, bringing the, these uh, uh, traditional practices to scale. How would you do that? I think the report of the commission highlight the fact that water is a common good. So that's a coincidence with what we have been saying from indigenous communities. So if we agree on that, it means that all stakeholders, including indigenous peoples, has an important role to really ensure these changes that we need. What do we need? We need our knowledge system to be recognized, but not only recognized by word. We need these knowledge systems and practices to be part of those recommendations of policy, in policies, in programs. We need resources for those knowledge systems to move from the local to the national and the international level. We need resources for exchanges so we can learn from one community in Latin America with a community in Africa and we can exchange practices. So we need resources, we need respect of different knowledge system, we need policies and we need mechanism to be in place to enforce those recommendations and those policies because there's a lot written but who enforces its application? How can we come back in five years and say, okay, we learn, now we are sharing and celebrating together. You and I think that's the role that the commission can help to play. And we are willing as indigenous peoples to be part of that dialogue. To, but we need respect. We need recognition. We need the application of the international standards of human rights. So I think that is what we bring to this conversation. And we, we know that we can share, but we need the opportunity and the space to share in, with good faith. I wish we could continue <laughs> talking some more. We have uh, more guests waiting for us. Josh, quick last thought here. Just an acknowledgement that we need uh, a workforce, a, a healthy workforce to work on these issues everywhere. Um, and yeah, that just needs to be recognized. Otherwise, we're going to have a major limiting factor to achieve any of this. In addressing the gender gap exactly. in the water Huge. sector as well. Huge. Yes, yeah, something that many people aren't uh, aware of that is gender inequality even in water. Thank you all so very much. Uh, you know, the, it's such a huge topic. We need dialogue. Cooperation is clearly vital. And um, it, it's heartening to hear that uh, there is this engagement. Uh, we're going to next talk about uh, the, what the water crisis means for food and trade for now. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's check out this next video that we have lined up for you. Towards a resilient water future, how can food and trade be part of the solution? Hello again. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome here to our studio Arunabha Ghosh, who is a commissioner as well with the Global Commission. He is also the founder, CEO of India's Council of Energy, Environment and Water, which is a leading uh, climate think tank. Uh, uh, and Claudia Sadoff is executive managing director of CGIAR, the world's largest agricultural innovation network. 
and Jean Fab is Danone's Sustainability Water Director. Thank you all so very much for coming in and, and helping us break you know, this down. It's a huge topic. There are so many different elements as we keep hearing uh, through uh, this conference. Water is connected to everything and we are all connected. Claudia, if I could start with you. We had Johan just now telling us how rainfall patterns are under threat from the changing hydrological cycle. What does that mean for food production, food security? Uh, how are some countries adapting to this new norm? Well, rainfall is really the primary way in which most people will experience climate change. And this new report is so profound in explaining the, the scale of the change that they're undergoing. The most immediate issues are around uh, extreme droughts and floods and the unpredictability of rainfall. So for food production, which uses 70% of the uh, water out there, fresh water, um, the question is how can we provide greater water security so that farmers can provide greater food security. And there really are a range of innovations that we have and that we can continue to use. Um, and they're essential not only in the sort of global market, but very particularly, and this is CGIR's focus with smallholder farmers, because in Africa, for example, over 95% of, of the agricultural land is rain-fed, which means that it's directly dependent on, on rainfall. So what can we do? There are a lot of uh, scientific innovations and practices that we have uh, and that we are continuing to work on that become not much more urgent as this unpredictability increases. So first we have all forms of information and warning, forecasting systems, um, and the opportunity to provide advisories, what to plant, when to irrigate, when to harvest. And these advisories, even with one, within one season, even over the radio, have been shown to increase productivity and livelihoods by 20, 30%. Very powerful. Then there are the adoption of more drought flood resilient seeds for crop varieties. We do a lot of that breeding and moving those onto farms in the right places is, is really an essential strategy. Water management and storage, soil moisture management, the green water that Johan was talking about, how to better manage soil water, how to manage um, our wetlands and our, at our watersheds for those purposes, but also agronomic practices like direct seeding of rice so we don't need to uh, flood big rice areas. There are so many different ways in addition, of course, to the policies that are needed to incentivize the uptake of all of these issues. So it's a range both <clears throat> of the scientific innovations from the seeds and the agronomic practices, but through to the policies, the policies domestically and all the way through trade because even some of these technologies are very difficult to move into different countries. So the ability to move those technologies appropriately is something that we can really work on to help buffer farmers against this terrible uncertainty that they're facing. Uh, could we look at that issue of trade? How can trade as Claudia was telling us, how can that help uh, move us in the right direction? I think the issue of trade is absolutely central to how we deal with water as a global common good. Uh, as we point out in our report, um, one in five calories consumed in the world today is traded, uh, which means that while we, are, while we might be producing- One in five calories. One in five calories is traded. So while we might be producing enough for the world, the question is, is it going to the right places? Is it going to the hungry and the vulnerable? And that's why we put it out in the, in the Global Commission's report that trade has to be a central driver of how we deliver on this global common good. Now, in order to do that, we've got to first understand that there's a lot of water that is embedded in the products that are, that are traded, both agricultural and non-agricultural. Um, this is called virtual water. Globally, about 300 cubic kilometers of virtual water is traded. Now, that's not in and of itself a bad thing. That's a good thing, except if it happens that water-rich regions are importing water-intensive products from water-poor regions, then it's a perversity. So we've got to fix that kind of you know, perverse patterns of trade. We're going to make sure that whether it is agricultural products, or it's non-agricultural products, the clothes that we are wearing. What is their water footprint? We're going to make sure that that water footprint is both about the blue water 
and also about the green water because that establishes the interdependency. We've got to then ensure that the trade agreements it themselves between countries at a multilateral level also embed within them this whole notion of water efficiency and water footprinting so that it's a conscious uh, outcome that we are seeking rather than an accidental uh, good or bad outcome in terms of, well, we just created things, we didn't think about water, now it's an afterthought. Uh, only if we get these building blocks right, the, the, the measurement, the accounting, the trade agreements, then we can look at are the patterns of trade geared towards drawing on the water-rich regions, delivering the water-intensive products and the water-poor regions, then getting the secure supply of those very products that they need. Jayan, what is the role of a multinational uh, company, a food giant like Danone, in moving this in the right direction? <clears throat> so, uh, as the, the two persons here were uh, highlighting, when we talk about uh, food, we talk about agriculture. Um, and there are plenty of solutions uh, in agriculture, and we, we can look at what are as, as a solutions. Um, we have developed a framework uh, around regionality of agricultural practices where we help resiliency of the farmers towards practices that help to reduce water usage at the farm level, but as well uh, improve water quality uh, because uh, with a set of practices you can um, improve soil health and then um, uh, reduce entrant in the soil. So that's one of the things uh, we can do, but what is uh, um, uh, highlighting in this, into this report is that we are shifting completely the way we look at water. A company like Danone, we were looking a lot about blue water, so how you actually protect watersheds, um, but now with this all green water perspective, we are shifting from a very localized approach mm. to a global approach. Mm. Then it's completely uh, redefining collaborations that needs to be developed, radical collaborations between private companies, but as well public sectors, civil societies, communities, and how we all are gonna be in capacity to adapt, either locally, but as well globally. And we are ready uh, to do that based on pre-competitivity, so working with other companies that might be competitors in some case, and as well, uh, working by sharing data, knowledge. We have data, we have knowledge, we can share because I think what this report is highlighting as well, it's everything is based on science. It's only if you have good science base that you're in capacity to tailor the right interventions. So, and I guess we all have part of the science locally, and so if we are in capacity to share it, we can accelerate interventions and tailor them to uh, d the different ecosystems that will be threatened by climate change and socioeconomic development in different ways in the years to come. We talked about even working with your competition, right? Because we need collaboration uh, now more than ever. What do you uh, want from the commission, how can they help you with your work at CGIAR? Well, I think the, <clears throat> the commission is so important and let me express my gratitude to the commissioners and all those who have supported this. It was very interesting in, uh, in a session of the commissioners yesterday here at the UN Water Conference. Um, it was, they spoke about the fact that the economics and the science are very well known, but the politics aren't. The politics aren't moving. We can all see where we're headed, and, and yet there isn't the movement we'd like. Um, we used to almost, almost joke about the fact that in the uh, World Economic Forum risk rankings, water was always huge, but medium term. So what's really exciting about this report is that it's made it very clear that the water cycle is being affected today. And I, and I can't say from a water perspective just how profound that scientific evidence is. So it's this movement and this recognition that it's sort of an all-hands effort, right? We know that water has always been water supply, sanitation, environment, agriculture, etc. Bringing in the trade angle, I think, is extremely important. And if you combine that with the results that we heard uh, in this new report, the idea that changing land use patterns in a large and in very profound ways can change the water cycle, even as we look toward virtual water trade, which is such an important way 
of moving the unequal shares of water across the world efficiently from country to country. <clears throat> if we do want to move toward a world where there's more specialized production in water-rich regions, that could mean very significant land use changes. We have to think up a level again then, how might that affect the water cycle as well? So the, the level of questions and the reach beyond the water sector and the political uh, and, and financial support to continue to do the science. We do have so many scientific innovations, um, but we've never quite scaled up to this global space as effectively as the, as, the council, as the commission is pushing us to go. I think that that is very profound. Um, I think that the support at this level uh, to, to, to create the action and the immediacy of the water challenge, which it's always been there in enormity, but not in immediacy, that's, I, I think, uh, a really profound contribution of the, council, of the commission. Because now we cannot ignore mm -hmm. this crisis. Uh, it's staring us, well, a lot more than in the face. Um, Jean, what about you? How, how do you think you could work with the, the commission? How could they help you with, uh, you know, in the private sector? Um, I think it's going to be about defining the roles and responsibilities in, in, of all the sectors, all the water users, uh, in managing water better. Um, a role a company like Danan could play and work with the commissions, for example, is how we can structure financing uh, to flow towards projects that can really improve water security. Um, I'm thinking of designing portfolio of projects that can reach uh, large scale size of pipelines that can unlock private financing. We see difficulties. Water is a, is a, is a weird animal. Uh, it takes time actually to develop uh, projects that can reach the scale we need to have the impact we need. And for that, we need to innovate in terms of financing. And I hope that with the commissions and the report, we at least going to have the open dialogue between, um, yes, businesses like us, but I will private financing and public uh, financing as well to have those flow of financing that are there going towards the, the right project. Arunaba, how do you see uh, the Global Commission's role in this to promote food security while keeping pressure as low as possible on, on, on water? So I think what we have done so far, you know, there, we have different types of failures. We've tried to correct for the science failure, where we looked at not just blue water, but strongly brought, brought forward this whole issue of green water. But there are market failures as well. And this is exactly what Jan is referring to, that in order to keep the water footprint low and yet increase the food security, we need to make sure that we have the, the financing solutions that aggregate a lot of the sustainable water practices that smallholder farmers might be practicing but are not attractive enough for large institutional investors. When we are able to scale that up, some of that market failure goes. But then there is a set of political failures. And the biggest political failure is a lack of trust. If I have to trust you that you will supply me with the food I need when I need it and you will not impose an export control, uh, I need to be able to deal with that trust deficit. Um, combined with that, if we could have technology co-development of the water solutions, which require the smallholder farmers, which require large companies, but which also require multilateral banks, donors, et cetera, to come together, then everyone has a stake in developing these new technology, more sustainable technologies of the future. Um, so dealing with the science failures, the market failures, and the political failures is the kind of theory of change that we will, we will need to execute uh, in the near term and not leave it to the medium term. Thank you all so very much indeed. Again, as with our former panel, I wish we could continue talking. There's so much more to discuss, but thank you for wrapping that up for us. We need dialogue. We've heard that many times. And we need uh, financing and the political will to scale already existing solutions and bring it to those who need it the most. Thank you all very much indeed for your time with us. Um, and uh, we're going to move on to our last segment of this discussion right after this.
The world must value water differently, governed as a global common good and to ensure equity and inclusive development. Hi there. Welcome back uh, to our discussion on the Global Commission's uh, new report that's just been released. Here with us now in the studio to help us wrap up this discussion, uh, if it's possible to wrap it up, uh, we're really just beginning it. Um, we have Mariana Mazzucato, who is co-chair of the Global Commission and professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London. And uh, also Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwela, who is also co-chair of the Commission and director general of the World Trade Organization. And also at the table with us is Ivan Akisoy, who's commissioner and of the commission and former mayor of the city of Freetown in Sierra Leone. Thank you all ladies so very much for being part of the commission and for being here with us. Um, if we could start with you, please, uh, Mariana. So the commission has a seven point call to collective action. How much progress do you believe is really possible in this current decade? I think there's lots that's possible, but only if we admit why we have failed, where the bottlenecks have been. And the area that I think that we have been strongest on is saying that it's not by chance, it's not a coincidence that we're failing. It's not a coincidence that, as Greta Thornburg tells us, we keep blah, blah, blahing. We have the wrong framing. We have thought that we could just fill the gaps, correct some market failures here and there, and then solve the sustainable development goals. And we're about to have the SDG summit. And water is at the center of every single one of the SDGs. And we talk about the need to change the economic framing away from market fixing towards actively shaping and creating a new economy, one that's inclusive and sustainable. And there's no better area than water to do that. Why? Because water, first of all, it cuts across the entire economy. There's no sector that doesn't use water. It cuts across production, distribution, and consumption. Uh, but we need a systemic way to understand how to solve it. We need a collective way to actually work together. And we focus on the idea of the common good, which is different from the public good, which in economics is like one side, the government fixing the gap, filling the gap of something the private sector is not doing, whereas the common good focuses on the opportunity for co-investing, uh, innovating together. But that means really taking care that along the way, the process is done with equity at the center. So the idea of just water partnerships means that we shouldn't just blah, blah about public and private working together. They need to work together in an inclusive way. And that's why there should be conditional finance. We need to make sure, for example, that development banks, when they're providing loans to sectors, those sectors commit to actually reducing the inefficient use of water. There are so many leakages in the system. We're not actually recycling wastewater. 80% of wastewater goes wasted. <laughs> um, it's not getting recycled. And, and that's not going to change just by talking about it in a commission. It has to change at the center of the new contracts, a social contract between all the different partners. So I think the coolest thing that we've done is to say that's not going to happen without new economic thinking. And the seven points across them is this idea of systemic and collective action, market shaping, not market fixing, and the common good at the center of the how. Dr. Ngozi, how has the report been received so far? It's got these actual steps that can be taken. How has it been received, being received, and how do you get more people on board? Well, thank you. Um, it's early days yet, uh, but what we've seen so far is that really, it, it seems to be resonating with a lot of people. And I would say that at this conference here, it's been very well received. And I think it's been well received because it's responding, uh, not just talking about problems and challenges, but actually proffering uh, solutions, pointing out where we can get things to be better, to be reshaped. And um, so just, for instance, the issue of the economics of water. We know we've mismanaged uh, water. We know that by 2030, if we don't start fixing things, there'll be 40 percent short of freshwater supplies. Uh, you know, so we put out all these facts, but what are the solutions that we begin to look at? So we talked about this new economics, and we've pointed out that there need not be a trade-off between e efficiency and equity. Most people are worried that, you know, water is a resource everybody needs. So if you talk about 
valuing water or pricing water, they are worried that poor people won't get access. What we're trying to point out is that, indeed, for poor people to get access, we must use water more efficiently so there is enough for everyone. So we shouldn't really worry about this trade-off. We should be talking about both efficient use and equitable access for all. And I know, as a young girl in the village in Nigeria, having to walk miles to fetch water, how precious this resource is. So we must have both. So efficiency actually means equity. equity. It leads to equity. Absolutely, absolutely. We cannot have one without the other. Without the other. Mm. Yvonne, what would you say to someone who feels the report and the recommendations are too ambitious? I'll say we're running out of time. We've run out of mm. time, and ambition is what we need right now. We actually um, said about this with an appreciation that by 2050, if change doesn't happen and change doesn't get built in now, we will be so locked into the irreparable damage. As others have said, and as we have all know, the 17 SDGs are underpinned by water. There's no solution for poverty, for food security, for energy, without water, all of them. So we don't have the luxury of thinking that what we're proposing is too ambitious. I think the way the report has been set out, it gives a pathway. And what we need now, as um, Dr. Ngozi was saying just a little while ago, is we need to make sure the policy makers are really getting this. We need to internalize this. We've been talking about climate change, and even that discussion is not moving into implementation as fast as it needs to. But the situation with water is so foundational and fundamental that even our actions, climate change is moving the environment. It's actually impacting, as you've just come up on the screen, as if by magic. <laughs> um, it's moving the, 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 the environment in a direction which is making our water crisis more severe. It's, they, they are, it's a vicious cycle and the water is at the heart of it. So no, I don't think it's too ambitious. And I feel for those who are thinking that, that they need to look again at what the science is saying and realize that as has been said, this is not a trade-off um, between equity and efficiency. This is something that if we don't do now, um, next year without action is already helping us to get to a point where it's going to be too late. I don't want to sound, you know, kind of, um, well, I do want to sound. Apocalyptic. I do, not apocalyptic. <laughs> That's why I was hesitating. I want to sound as we all should, as if this is an urgent crisis that needs to be addressed now from the local to the national, to the regional, to the global. We've all got a part to play across all sectors. Because it affects us all. It affects everyone. Yeah, we can't run away from it anymore. Um, Dr. Ngozi, uh, what is your ask going forward in this discussion, conversation that's just beginning from this conference? My ask is uh, simply that we've got to, our policy makers, our leaders in the world have to realize that time is running out. Mm -hmm. So I'd like them to do that because that would lead them to really empower the kind of change in governance uh, that we're looking for. Uh, we need to find someone who can take water forward. We are asking uh, not only perhaps for uh, an, um, uh, an envoy for water who can continuously put this in front of the eyes of everyone, we might even need a scientific panel uh, mm -hmm. or maybe not a panel, not as complicated as the uh, IPCC, but something light that will put the science continuously before us and remind us and hold us accountable. Um, and, and then we need uh, people to focus on this new economics to accept that we have to value water properly uh, if we are going to have enough of it. So those are three asks that I have. Let's value water. Let's also, and I want to really stress this, we've got about $700 billion in subsidies, both agricultural and water subsidies, some of which are distortive meaning they are not really helping. They are leading to overconsumption of water and overuse. Um, maybe we can redirect them, uh, to, to especially to help provide poor people with access, to make that equity, the investments that are needed to make equity work. So why should we have subsidies going the wrong way? Let's have these subsidies going the right, going the right way. way. And Yvonne, 
your asks here. Um, I wish we could continue, but we have to wrap up our conversation. What are your asks? The challenge with water now, too much water flooding, um, too little water drought, too dirty water in so many parts of the world, particularly in the areas that I come from. Um, we have millions of people dying from contaminated water consumption. We're expecting 1.4 billion more potentially from food insecurity. My ask is the same as Dr. Ngozi's. We need the urgency of this to be amplified and we need practical actions. We need space at local levels. As a mayor of a city, I'm very, very aware that one of the challenges we often have in local government is a lack of clarity about mandates and the overlaps, which mean that things fall through the cracks. The people are the heart of this, and millions of people are suffering already today in many parts of the world who aren't responsible for the crisis that we have now in the water cycle globally. Mm -hmm. This impact on precipitation, which means for the first time we're seeing fresh water sources actually being negatively impacted by human action. My ask is that we wake up and act now. Mariana? Well, there's an SDG summit in September. Water should be at the center of that because of everything we've just said. Water is at the center of the sustainable development goals. I remember, Yvonne, at our first commission meeting, you told us all that as mayor, you witnessed the fact that many you know, young women get raped on their way to fetch water. So gender parity, SDG 5, is related to water. All of them are. But so what does that mean for the SDG summit in September? I think that's important. Uh, Dr. Ngozi talked about the need for a UN water envoy. That's one of our recommendations. But also the modeling that we've offered, I think, is quite uh, radical. So one of the co-chairs is Johan Rockström from the Potsdam Institute. And he's really shown us through really uh, rigorous modeling that um, deforestation on one continent is actually causing droughts in another. Uh, overly intense crop irrigation in one part of the world is causing flooding in another. So that kind of systemic nature of the problem requires systemic and collective action, and that again is where we're trying to also bring the tools for that at the center of the contracts between all these different actors. So the conditionalities, the new forms of partnerships, um, the new ways to think of property rights. You know, we haven't talked about that yet, but the governance of this means that ownership structures need to be much more collective if we're interested in um, you know, equity and inclusive outcomes. And I think one thing that Dr. Ngozi said which should absolutely happen is that we need to repurpose these subsidies mm -hmm. towards the transformation that's required. There's so much innovation. That's why we talk about the outcomes-oriented, mission-oriented need for innovation. Going to the moon and back required innovation, not just in aerospace, but nutrition, materials, electronics, software. The same is true for all the different sectors in our economy if water is at the center of a mission-oriented system. So moonshot thinking in every sector. Every sector Absolutely. needs to change, but they won't change on their own. They actually require that kind of repurpose of our current tools. Thank you all so very much for wrapping this up for us so succinctly. It won't be easy, obviously. Uh, may there be real momentum mm -hmm. from the work that you're doing from this conference, from the conferences that are, are coming up to generate the will really needed to effect real and lasting change. The world needs it. Again, thank you so much you. Uh, for being here. And uh, thank you also to our viewers for watching. I will be back at 3 p.m. New York time with our next show where we'll be looking at the role that finance plays in the water crisis. Do join us then. For now, from me and our team, goodbye.